Good evening. I'm Pat Hanlon. I'm the vice chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals, and I've been designated as chair for tonight's meeting. And I'm calling this meeting of the board to order. It is now 7th uh, 31 in the evening. Um, and I ask all attendees who are not recognized to speak to please mute their connection until such time as they recognize the chair by the chair. I'd like to rec confirm that all members and anticipated officials are present. Members would include Christian Klein. Here. Roger DuPont. Here. Daniel Riccardelli. Here. Venkat Holy. Here. Elaine Hoffman. Here. And Adam LeBlanc. Here. Uh, the only town official here is uh, would be Colleen Ralston. You're here? I'm here. Uh, and we have with us tonight outside council, Paul Haverty um, of BBH Law. Paul? Mr. Chairman. Good evening. Um, tonight, there's nobody appearing for anybody else because this is a deliberation session rather than a public hearing. Um, and for that reason, we will not be taking any additional um, any additional information uh, uh, any additional information relating to the case. The only matter on our agenda is the 40B application of uh, Housing Corporation of Arlington at 10 Sunnyside. Uh, we closed the hearing on this on the 15th of August, um, and uh, we are beginning the first. Uh, the first uh, deliberation session. Um, this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely consistent with the Supplemental Appropriations Act signed into law on March 29, 2023, which intend extended until March 31st, uh, 2025, the suspension of the requirement to hold all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Public bodies may continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the public a body physically present at a meeting location so long as they provide adequate alternative access to remote meetings. Public bodies may meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom application with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by uh, ACMI. Uh, all supporting materials that have been provided to members of this body are available at this meeting's, on this meeting's agenda or the town's website, unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. There's only one matter on our agenda tonight, as I indicated before, and that is the beginning of the deliberation session on uh, on 10 uh, Sunnyside uh, Avenue. So at the outset, I'd like to review with you what I am hoping to do tonight in terms of uh, our procedure. Uh, by now, you the, the you all have, and soon when we share the screen, Christian will put up on the screen um, a draft with lots and lots of comments and corrections and additions and even some subtractions um, of the opinion that was prepared by uh, by Paul Haverty in August. Um, this will be our basic text, and we'll be marking up this text over the course of this evening and probably uh, Tuesday evening next uh, next week. Um, I'd like to start with the uh, be at the beginning, um, and then in a very non-Aristotelian way, skip over to the end and do the, so after we do the facts, uh, skip to the waivers, which are a big part of what ultimately we will do, and then go back and go through uh, and go through the conditions. Uh, I'm anticipating that this will take at least the, next, the two meetings, the meetings that we have scheduled. I'm hoping it's only those two meetings. Um, I know there are some things that we're going to take a little bit of extra time to work out, um, but I'd like to get as far tonight as as we can. The uh, there at this point, I'd like to sort of have as a general guideline uh, that will aim for about two hours. Uh, so that'll take us until until uh, 935, which is two hours from now. That's sort of a, a soft stop. So we could go on a little bit after that. But 
uh, are, you know, you, your ability to process all this begins to decline a little bit after a couple of hours. And so uh, it would be probably worthwhile uh, to, um, it would be worthwhile to uh, uh, give ourselves, to pace ourselves uh, this time. I'm hoping that it will take no more than two hours to do the whole thing. So at this point, let me pause. And if there are any questions or suggestions, uh, I'd uh, like to hear them. And if not, we might be at the point where uh, Christian should share his screen. My understanding is that all of you have or have access to or have received uh, a copy of the opinion that we'll be working with uh, so that you can skip around in that, uh, uh, even if Christian isn't actually uh, showing it at the time. Uh, but, uh, so that's where we'll go. So let's, again, let me say if there are any, if, if there are any questions or, uh, anything further that I ought to ex explain or that you want to explain to me. I would just ask Colleen if she could make me a co-host. All right, then. Um, so Christian, I, this would be a time for... And this will give us a chance to start at the beginning. Um, so I'm not quite sure. There's there's some interference, and I'm not sure where it's coming from. Um, but if you could check the mutes that you're supposed to have, then that will help. So let's begin at the beginning, um, and we'll start with the procedural history. Um, the first general issue here is in the very fourth line. Uh, and the the I think that this is resolved uh, unless someone has information to the contrary. There, there we for a long time have been assuming that the commercial office portion of this project was 940 square feet. Um, but on further investigation, it's pretty hard to believe why we ever thought that. Uh, the plans indicate that it's actually 608 square feet. Uh, and the uh, Ms. O'Connor uh, changed an earlier draft when we on April on August fifteenth to six hundred. Uh, so you'll see there the six hundred square feet is it goes in. There's actually lots of other places where that comes up, uh, but unless anyone has a reason to object to six hundred square feet, um, I thought we might begin by doing that and and succeeding in solving a lot of other problems at the same time. So I'll give you a chance to look at this. I mean, the next change is a number four, which I don't think needs any discussion, but if anyone wants to raise a point about it, this is your time. All right, going on to- The other thing I will do is I'll go back and change business four, because uh, that's not the name, proper name for the district. Um, it's, it's automotive something. I just need to look it up and I'll fix that. Right, right. Okay, that sounds good. And the addition of residential uses on Michael Street and Silk Street is probably uncontroversial. On number five, um, the we were attempting to deal there with uh, impervious surface. Uh, the uh, testimony that we have is was 96 percent uh it was not so clear what uh the total impervious surface uh would be and that has been uh has been deleted um and uh, if uh, that seems perfectly appropriate and it's not worth it to try to find out more about finishing the last half of that but if if anyone thinks that that's a mistake please let me know Okay, the next item we have on the list um, is number seven. Uh, and this too was going to give rise to uh, a concern that will we'll go th go through uh, go through what we've rise at some other places as well. Um, the as you all know, for most of the time that we've had this, the applicant has been saying that it intends to 
uh, rent out the units in this building uh, to people who have incomes not exceeding more than 60% of the AMI. And that some of them would be reserved even for people who don't exceed 30% of the AMI. On April 5th, April, on August 15th, uh, the applicant said, well, we still intend to do that, but we'd like the flexibility to go all the way up to 80% of AMI, which is basically what's allowed under um, uh, under the, uh, the general, under in 40B generally. Um, so the question here is whether to accept the applicant's request that we replace, or I'm not quite sure about replacing, but that we include the language about going up to 80% of the AMI, uh, or uh, whether we leave that alone. Uh, so there are two options that are, are set forth here. Um, the option that that you don't actually see as an option because it's what we already have is what I would su suggest we should consider. Um, the applicant may be looking for flexibility, but a statement in the introduction to this uh, document does not give them flexibility. Uh, and nor does the condition that we have when this comes up later on give them flexibility. They have the flexibility because we don't have any jurisdiction to set what the maximum amount is anyway. Um, and it seemed to me, and uh, when I thought about the request of uh, the applicant, that having gone through all of these hearings, where both for us and for the public, the 60% figure was a really important part of what we thought made this project and what was important about this project, um, the applicant may yet persuade their funding source to do something up to 80%, and we won't have anything to say about it. But I didn't want to sort of include the 80% figure in our permit as if we think that it's okay to switch basically from the 60% level that we've all been assuming to the 80%. And it's not that the applicant wants to do the 80%. They just want the flexibility to do it. They still tell us that what they want is to continue with the plan that they've already had. So I would suggest that we not include the up to 80% language here and stick here and later on with Mr. Haverty's language, which ultimately will strongly encourage them to stick at 60%, but while recognizing that we don't have jurisdiction to compel that one way or the other. So that's the issue here, and I leave it up to the rest of you whether that makes sense to you or whether you think that we ought to be including the 80% figure. I, I do have a question for Paul on this. The project eligibility letter says 100% at 60% AMI. Are we allowed to adjust that? I wouldn't say that you're necessarily allowed to adjust it, but ultimately the affordability requirements are within the exclusive jurisdiction of the subsidizing agency. I will tell you that I drafted a decision for a board a couple of years back where all I did was regurgitate the exact language that was in the project eligibility letter from the subsidizing agency. The developer appealed the decision for a, a number of different reasons, but one of the things they appealed was the condition that parroted the language from the PEL in the Housing Appeals Committee overturned that language and said, you can't impose that as a requirement, even though that's exactly what they proposed. Okay. Even though the decision expressly um, ceded that it was the authority of the subsidizing agency. So, I, I mean, I think that we're safe in leaving this as drafted because it simply notes what was proposed. It doesn't attempt to impose any sort of requirement mm -hmm. on the affordability. And, and I think, you know, we, we can leave it at that. Mr. Chairman. Mr. DuPont. So I, I agree with that too, as long as they haven't actually proposed 80% in, in their hearings, I think that we're just stating what it is that they've previously said in whatever their filings were. Plus, I think you were referring to B1 that Mr. Haverty had drafted, which right. sort of explains the jurisdictional issue in all of this and says that even though they're saying 
60 percent, 100, you know, 60 percent and 100 percent of the units that we really don't have any say in that anyway, just as Mr. Haverty had explained when he had essentially parroted the language from the project eligibility letter. So I agree, leave it as is at 60 percent. And then we deal with the issue again in uh, B1, I believe it is down on, I think, the page 10, roughly. Right. Or do we leave it in the findings as 60 to 80 percent? Because they did mention in the hearing that they wanted the flexibility. And then when we go to conditions, we say we want them to stick with the project eligibility letter. Well, my recollection of the hearing is is a little different from that. Yeah. They they said they they continue to intend to do I mean, in a way, it's a question is what the intent is. Their plan, <clears throat> and maybe plan is better than proposal here. Their plan is to stick with the 60. But, you know, there's lots of uncertainties in life, and they want the flexibility, which they have, and which we're not taking away from them, mm -hmm. to go up to 80%. I, I think condition B1 provides them all of the flexibility that they need. The finding simply denotes what was in their application. Perfect. So at this point, I rather than, I don't want to vote on each one. Is there a consensus to stick with with uh, with Mr. Haberty's language here? Okay, stay with it. Yep. Okay. All right. So yeah. the next uh, the next play. Uh, there's we just I'm I'm not going to do this generally, but I do want to say that I I'm pretty sure that I'm guessing that Samiotis consult is consultants rather than yeah. consultantes <laughs> their south american uh branch office is consultantes but got I got it but we mostly are not going to we are going to leave this up to the drafters to try to get these things thing and not waste our, our time on it so the next thing is is number 10 um, most of this, I think, is uncontroversial. It just, it, I think that we started with the language from an earlier case, and it turns out that in this case, different agencies had uh, consulted. Um, I have two questions. One is, it's I didn't take out the Inspectional Services Department, but I don't know that they consulted. They're the only ones that I don't have a record, and I couldn't say for sure that they wouldn't. But on the other hand, there's lots of things, and I wondered if anyone else was aware of the participation of ISD in any of this. Well, I would point out that Colleen Ralston is an employee of the Inspectional Service. That's true. That's true. All right. Well, that's substantial. That that's significant input. That's for Absolutely. sure. Um, I wanted to emphasize the Conservation Commission. It comes up a little bit later on. It explicitly declined to comment because this was not in their jurisdiction. As you all know, they when they say that they must be talking about their jurisdiction under local law as well as under state law because our history with them is that when they but for 40b would have a uh, jurisdiction over a local law thing uh, they are not the least bit shy about providing us with comments on applications so uh, they really this really pretty much takes care of the wetlands issue at least from uh, the point of view of the, both the state act and the local bylaw and regulations. Mr. Hanlon, may I ask a yes. question? Um, Please. I'm going slightly backwards, but on, on number seven, that that 25% that it lists first, is that, um, so it's all affordable, but that 25% is the voucher program housing? Is that is that what that's indicating? Mr. Havity, you want to answer that? No, so the the twenty five percent is the minimum amount required to be affordable, uh, to, to, in order for it to be an eligible Chapter Forty B development. Although actually, it could be twenty percent because they're they're doing it at less than. Um, well, if they if they wanted it to be twenty percent, they would have to be having them all at a minimum of fifty percent area median income. So they couldn't do that if they're going to have some 60%. So it has to be a minimum of 25%. And then we're noting that their proposal is that 100% will be restricted. But we can't require that 100% be restricted as affordable because that's within the exclusive jurisdiction of the subsidizing agency. Is that okay, Mr. Reddy? Dan, you're... Sorry, sorry, muted. 
Okay, I, I understand now. Um, so, so theoretically, I'm not saying that they would do this, but theoretically, this approval would could be for 25% affordable housing if if the subsidizing agency uh, wanted it to be. Well, it it would require them to go with a new subsidy program okay. because the subsidy program that they're using is going to require 100% affordable okay. Okay. because it's low income housing tax credit. It would it would literally require a reimagining of the entire project. So I, I don't think that's in the cards here. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Welcome. Okay, so are there any other proposed changes in number 10? I, so let's go on to um, I, I don't have anything more to draw to your attention until number 14. Uh, so uh, does anyone have something to that you'd like to bring up on the jurisdictional findings, starting with 11? Okay. Number 14 is, uh, is a rewrite. Uh, which says a little more detail about the uh, commercial uses and uh, which includes how far away from them. Is there, are there any questions about that one? Okay, if not, let's go on to number 15. Number 15 is there because uh, in talking about the location, it's helpful to talk about the various ways in which um, the project is, particularly from a mobility point of view is is uh, ideal for uh, uh, for for this site and so it refers to shopping and and other things that are are quite uh, are quite nearby um, does anyone have any comments on that one Okay, seeing done, let's go on to number, whoops, number 16 should be pretty uncontroversial. It just says that the uh, intersection uh, of Alewife Brook and Broadway is 370 feet away. Does anyone have any comment on that? Okay, let's go on to number 17. Uh, and you can tell from all the red that number 17 is sort of more uh, more interesting than some of the others. Um, the the there are two aspects of of the there's well there are three paragraphs there that that this all has to do with uh, the parking. Um, the first is a is a general. Uh, is one formulation of what the rule what the rules are and the next paragraph after that which is uh uh which i think is is partly wrong but you'll see uh or at least incomplete the next paragraph is uh provides more about what the parking requirements actually are um and just to summarize them um uh, the you're supposed to have one parking space per unit is is 43 uh, because you're providing affordable housing for all of those you get 10 percent discount that takes you to 39 that's what the legal requirement is the board has the ability uh, if certain criteria are met to reduce that uh, down to 25 percent of 39 uh, which would be 10 basically um, and that is sort of basically what is uh, included in the in the middle paragraph there. The reason why we go into it, I, or I suggest going into it in some detail, is that from the very first day, everybody has been getting this wrong. Uh, the applicant's transportation analysis was totally on another planet when it dealt with this. Um, and while uh, Ms. O'Connor corrected it at, at our second meeting, um, it still had been a problem all the way through. And so it seemed to be worthwhile to take a little bit of extra space and to uh, set forth what our role here is, which is we have the discretion whether to provide the parking 
um, the parking reductions. Um, the next paragraph uh, re re addresses really whether whether 21 is uh, enough is is uh, uh, and if you remember the, the applicant produced information that indicated that the rate of parking usage per unit on this one is pretty similar to the average of similarly sized projects that they uh, operate uh, others and and put that information um, in the record. So in doing all of that, this is intended ultimately to set forth the factual basis for our the parking requirements and, and the possibility of a parking reduction later on. So um, I would suggest that we go with the longer version. Uh, it's more complete and, and avoids the potential uh, for inaccuracy. Um, but I leave it open to you. Does anyone have any comments on this one? Pat, if we go with the longer, we would take the basically paragraphs, the two paragraphs that are there, correct? The one that begins the applicant and the second one begins the 21 spaces? Yes. Okay. Yes. So what would what would go is the first alternative, which is the first paragraph there, and then the others <clears> would be accepted. And this would all occur as number, I think as number 18. That's, uh, I don't know. <laughs> okay, but it needs an independent number. It right? needs a number, right. Okay. I, I agree with the longer version as well. Okay, the next one, the next number, which which who knows what that number will turn out to be, but the next real number that starts several neighbors express concern is, uh, is this, it's part of an effort, which you'll see in some other paragraphs of more explicitly uh, taking into account the public testimony and indicating the, uh, uh, the indicating the way in which they're being treated. Uh, so number number seventeen, at least on my copy, is uh, talks about the general height of 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 the building. Um, is there any? So I have one question on that, and maybe Mr. Klein can answer it. Is that at one point during the hearing, I asked what what would happen if we did what was being asked us asked and that was to require four stories rather than five and there was very strong testimony that that would essentially sound the death knell for the project and i'm wondering if we should find should at least note that that for the record that was what the response was and if so whether this is the place to do that well we certainly could include that um would ask Paul what he thinks. All right, that's fine with me. I wasn't sure if I was on mute or not. <laughs> Trying to keep up with the changes too. I mean, to me, that was the that was the moment in which fooling around with the height of the building was essentially taken off the table, because we wouldn't have been able to accomplish what the neighborhood wanted, and and still have a, a project left. Just a quick question about the uh, language. Um, so uh, make the project impractical. Are we commenting on the um, econ what what's the term that they use in the decision on economical? If you have a condition that makes it so that they're not going to 
do you know make what they need to make so i guess it's from mr haverty do we use the word uneconomical or whatever that term is uh, the it's term uneconomic uneconomic would that yep. be used in in place of impractical there do you think certainly could be i didn't know if it made sense only because it ties into the to the statute right it ties into the standard of the standard right yeah Okay, we had number 18. Again, this is addressing uh, some of the testimonies. Um, Mr. Klein, I wonder when we say several tenants, I, I remember one, but I don't remember the others. Uh, there, was a, there was a letter from a second, I believe. I see, um, okay. It is possible it, that it was one who was just very vocal in a lot of different formats. Um, <laughs> I could take out the word several. Make that current. Um, I would, I would, I guess I'd say that several just emphasizes that there seems to be more than one, and I there can't have been more than two, and Ms. Fontenot raised yeah. this quite a bit but but she was raising a lot of things like that okay and could we maybe say at the end at those facilities because and the reason i'm thinking about that is that actually it, it doesn't make sense to get into indoor air quality here it wasn't a major issue mm -hmm. but it's ironic to raise it because this is passive house construction and it will one of the benefits of doing that is to have super high air quality for the for the tenants so it is useful to know that they're talking about other facilities that have been constructed in a different way and mr chairman along those lines i just think it would clarify it if we said tenants of other hca properties because they're not really referring to this Right. They couldn't actually, because it's just, it's not even a hole in the ground. But yeah, it, it's useful to remind people of that, I think. I'm comfortable with that. Part of the reason is that the, the applicant had said that they wanted to strike some of the stuff about the, the management plan that we have in the conditions. And I just wanted that this sort of leads to my wanting to maintain that. So I just wanted to. Got it include this fine. Got it. Got it. And certainly questions were raised about the adequacy of the management. And to some extent, the applicant did confess that it was a hard problem. So mm -hmm. uh, that that was a concern. All right. So we're ready to go back, go on to wetlands. Um, this sort of simplifies the uh it, it this sort of simplifies the analysis of the wetlands basically it, this is picking up the point made earlier about the conservation commission that they have jurisdiction not only over the state where they don't have to get an order of conditions but also the local bylaw and the regulations implementing that and the conservation commission has not asserted jurisdiction with respect to uh, that uh to that either um it's also helpful i think though uh, and new uh, 20 and 21, uh, which refer to zoning bylaw provisions that we haven't thought as much about as some others, like parking, for example. Um, and that this is sort of bringing into focus that we have those issues uh, as well, and that we need to make a finding in some way uh, of their meeting the both 5.7 and 5.8 of the zoning bylaw. Mr. Klein, do you have anything more to add to that? Um, I would just say we should probably strike 20 because 20 is already included in 21. Okay. Does anyone else have questions or comments on any of these?
So while Mr. Klein is is doing this part, I was I wondered if Mr. Ha for Mr. Haverty, uh, in what is at least for the moment twenty two still, um, where we say notwithstanding they still provided to this uh, natural and built environment uh, thing, is there any purpose being served by that? What why is it that we would care that they did that much of that was i had to do with stormwater and it wasn't really had, it wasn't really focused on wetlands at all and i'm just wondering why we're mentioning it so i'm sorry uh, mr chairman which this is, this is this is 22 is what it is on this it says although located out of the jurisdictional area the applicant submitted an impact analysis on natural and built environment prepared by utile and samiotes so all it says is that they filed this piece of paper, and I guess I'm not quite sure yep. why we bothered with that. Um, I don't think it's necessary. I mean, it's sort of just laying the groundwork as to what has been submitted. So it's just sort of pointing out that this is an issue that was at least reviewed. Okay. So I would I would suggest I mean it just seems to me after we've done done what we've done this kind of just interrupts the flow I don't feel strongly about it but uh, I'd recommend that that we take this out we don't generally put in that this or that paper was filed uh, and it as as it made more sense with a lot of the other things that are no longer in it in the section. Well, do you have any objection to that? Is that okay with you? That's fine with me. Was there anything in that analysis that made that had any bearing? I don't know. Not on wetlands. Yeah. Not on wetlands. Okay. It 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 had a lot to do with stormwater management. Most most of it was devoted to stormwater management, and some of it was the general kind of introductory material that every applicant. It puts in, but it wasn't really oriented towards wetlands. So I think through 23 are simple factual statements. Does anyone have any comment on those? No. Okay, number 24 um, oh, is the, earlier there was a there was a promise that later on we would talk about the uh, proximity to um, public transit. And this is the paragraph that does that. It's a little bit broader than the paragraph that we started with. Um, because um, it includes the Clarendon Busway, which also provides two stops. But I think as, as any of you who, who spend time down there would realize uh, and do realize the the 87 only runs some of the time. And it's re literally a four minute walk, uh, not counting the time it takes to wait for the light to change at Elwife Brook. Uh, to go to the Clarendon Hill busway. So even though it's in a foreign country called Somerville, it uh, it is very much a part of the transportation system. One of the buses there goes to Sullivan Square, somewhere near it. The other goes to Leechmere. All of them are connecting up to subway lines. And so when you put it all together, uh, it greatly increases the transportation accessibility of the project. So that's the reason for being a little broader there. Does anyone have any any questions, comments, revisions to that one? Okay, let's so now let me move. I carefully I just read that part, and of course there's an alternative just below. Uh, <laughs> and that's what we used to have. <laughs> so it's really more or less the same thing, but a little less. Mr. Klein, maybe you would like to address uh, number 25. Certainly. Um, <clears throat> so one of the things that had come up and was also was brought up in the first, definitely in the first and second hearings um, and in a couple of the letters that were uh, sent to the board 
with the the question about the the traffic on Sunnyside Avenue, how Sunnyside Avenue gets bogged down because there's parking on both sides of the street. Um, it's difficult to maneuver. It's difficult at the end of the street trying to move on to Broadway because there's parking on both sides all the way to the end. Um, and so I basically wanted to make sure to include this um, as a finding because it was something that the that the neighbors were particularly concerned about, but also um, later on there is a, a condition um, asking the applicant to uh, basically petition uh, the Transportation Advisory Committee to consider putting um, a temporary loading zone in front of the building <clears throat> and also having a no parking within 20 feet of the corner so that um, cars can move out of the center, out of the travel lane when they're making their turns. Is any further comment on this one? All right, going once, twice. I think we've accepted this one. Okay. That takes us to civil engineering. So I don't know that we need actually to discuss this one, I mean, through 28. Is, does anyone have any comments on 28? I forget who purple is. Uh, I think that's part, that's Paul, but. Yeah. Because we don't have impervious, be, because we, uh, <clears throat> The applicant is, I mean, this this is laying the basis in part for, originally they were going to have an infiltration system and now they're not. And uh, they've asked for a waiver of the uh, provisions of the local bylaw that in turn would impose the requirement to abide by the statewide manual, which is what this is all about. Um, and so the, abandoning the infiltration has largely pulled the reason out from from under this, um, the bylaw itself, the stormwater bylaw is inapplicable unless you increase the impervious surface by a certain amount uh, or have a, a disturbance of more than an acre. Uh, but here, the whole property is less than an acre and uh, the impervious surface will actually be less under this project than it was under before. So, uh, the bylaw probably on its own terms doesn't apply. And when we get to the waiver, we'll, uh, we'll address that. But this is ultimately related to that conclusion. So if there's no comment, I think we can probably say we're okay with that one. Mm -hmm. Now, with respect to number 29, uh, the so i did review the handbook yes um, and so what they're proposing is within the guidelines of the handbook for an existing parcel so it's you know we're not going to say that it's best management practices or anything like that but we're just going to say it's in compliance with mass standards okay paul does that seem right to you yep that seems fine okay all right, so we're now to solar access and shading impacts. Um, and again, Mr. Uh, Mr. Klein, you may want to address that one. Sure, so as everyone knows, I had requested shadow studies, and then there was a question about what the impact was gonna be for people with existing solar arrays. Uh, we finally convinced Utah to do the study, and they came back with their report at the, um, Either the last hearing or the second to last hearing showing that it would be a reduction of three one thousandth of a percent in the annual solar energy potential for the most impacted of the existing systems. So I just wanted to make sure that we included that finding here um, just to, because we had specifically requested that information. Does anyone have any questions or objections to that? Okay, let's uh, accept it. Yes, whoops. <laughs> That must be Elaine. Or... Yes, indeed. Um, there you go. Uh, so for the most impacted system, I'm just wondering if that could be further clarified. 
Mm -hmm. um, because if I'm remembering correctly, there is an existing system on the parcel that could that is the uh, that has the most potential to be impacted. Um, does that make sense? Like if that's different, that it could be a little clear because there could be an existing system um, mm -hmm. on a parcel, and then there's another site that could be impacted um, more substantially in the future. But I don't think that's actually the case here. Right. Uh... So I think it's something something about the most impacted site. I don't know what the right phrasing is there. Um, most impacted. Um, existing photovoltaic system. Impacted. So is it, Ms. Hoffman, is the point here that um, is, 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 is the point here that the that the site that is the potentially the most affected uh, is only this small amount, whether they have it or not, or is it that I mean because what happens was supposed to turned out that the most the existing site that an existing site has uh, uh, has a, a photovoltaic system. And but the one next door has a higher potential, but they don't have it yet. But maybe they say they want it, or maybe they don't, but somebody will want it. Uh, which are we concerned about? I, I mean, why? Why? why I guess my for the deeper question is why is should we care whether they have already got a photoelectric system or not? Because I'm not actually, ah. I'm not hundred percent sure that this that that this one does, but I, I maybe, I don't remember completely. Um, I don't care whether they have one or not. I just wanted the language to be accurate to what was assessed. So, oh. um, so what I think I thought it was. My memory of it, and I'm not looking at it right now, is that um, they were looking at the site that they were studying was the one that had the most potential for impact. So there, there was no other building, no other home in the area that could have a worse impact. Correct. Right. So I, and I, so I thought the language should reflect that rather than saying oh, system. So I think so. I think it's sort of the opposite for the language we now that we have now have in there. The important thing is that this is the worst case, basically, right? That's exactly. For the photovoltaic array, um, most impacted by the impact. like that. So the end of solar energy for the photovoltaic array most impacted by the increased shadowing from the project. I think that's fine. Okay. Good. Done. Thank you, Ms. Hoffman. So we can accept all that. Now we're back to affordability and local concerns. Um, and here there are, oops, let me just see. The um, paragraph 31 is a lot similar to uh, what we had in what we talked about earlier. And I would think that we'd want to resolve it in the same way. Uh, we've added here 
the project eligibility letter, which we discussed and that we didn't add in the other place. Um, I think I'm happy to going either way on this, but I wonder, Mr. Haverty, is there a danger in referring to the product eligibility letter? Is there a danger in referring to the project eligibility letter? Yes, no. it is here. When we talked about it before, we you yeah. eventually also told us about another place where you just copied the project eligibility letter and got your head handed to you by hack. And I was... So, if but again, nothing... this, so this is a finding. It's not a condition. Right. So we're not imposing any sort of requirements as part of this finding. We're just parroting what was submitted to the board. So there's right. no danger involved there. Great. So in light of that, I'm perfectly happy with it. Does anyone, does anyone have a problem? Okay, so let's let's accept that one. And you notice that we're almost getting, we're almost through with the facts. Number 32. So, Mr. Klein, why don't you address that one? Sure. So, 32 again. Um, so, I spent a lot of time rereading every single piece of correspondence the board received on this hearing. Um, and many of them were very much in favor of the application. Um, and specifically, we're very glad about the deeper level of affordability that was being offered. Um, and so I just wanted to capture that in the findings. Does anyone have any comment on that? Okay, without objection, why don't we take that as accepted? So I have a question. So while that process is going on, I have a question that I want that I just thought of as we've been working our way through uh, this. Uh, one of the major one of the things about this that sort of is lurking in the background uh, about the project is that it really does go quite far in terms of sustainability. Uh, it's going to be passive house construction. It's going to have solar on the roof, if I, re 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 if I remember correctly. Um, it is not quite all electric, but it's mostly electric with one exception that they're going to be essentially pre-wiring to turn to electric when it's possible. And I was wondering whether the thought did occur to me that especially with the, the with these kinds of things being brought up in, in a adversarial way uh, by objectors, whether it would make sense someplace earlier on in the discussion of, of projects to have a finding of fact relating to sustainability that's along the lines that uh, uh, that I just said. It, it, that is actually something that is in the uh, impact report that, that we just took out. But um, so I, I raised that. It's, if that makes sense, we can come back with language. It would be a simple paragraph uh, to uh, to insert. Is anyone but me attracted by doing that? Mr. Hanlon. Yes, Mr. Jacardelli. I, I agree. I think I, I know. I think that's a great idea to to do that. I, I did have a question though. I, you know. I think I remember from the conversation, I'm not sure about the impact report, but they, I think they said that they were exploring passive house. I couldn't remember if they committed to that or not. Um, so I just, just asking the question whether that was decided or if that was an option. On that one, it was decided, so, although it isn't, I mean, we're not being, have not been asked to require it and, and haven't required it. They we have we we do require something with the all electric part, but not the passive house part. Mm -hmm. But I mean, the, the other thing is is that I mean, you should realize that although they were very helpful to the town in offering testimony necessary to adopt the specialized stretch code, that will apply to them anyway, and they won't have a choice about passive house. Yes, that that's a very important point. I think I I'm not. I think it should be clear in the language that it's um. It's 
aligned with what will be required. Yep. Maybe I'm speaking out of turn, but I, I think I I think that their uh, attorney at one point had argued that, or maybe I'm getting this confused with the last 40B project that uh, because this was a state process, they didn't know if they needed to comply with the new specialized stretch code. That was I, well. That did come up in the other process. Oh, that was the. I don't. Other. I, don't I don't remember Ms. O'Connor ever. Okay. Ever saying that, and mm -hmm. I. I will say that that HCA did testify before the mm -hmm. select board in favor of the specialized stretch code. They're they're not seeking, they're not seeking, uh, to get away from that. Okay. And Great. and Utile also testified in favor of the stretch code. So they've, they've been strongly supportive. It's, they're, they're not just an ordinary uh, apartment builder who will have to follow the law. I'll get, I'll get some language to you for next time and, 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 and we'll see. I'll, it'll be pretty, pretty plain vanilla, but it will just sort of announce it. And I'll make clear that it's understood that, that the, uh, I mean, the town's position, as is the state's position, is that the specialized stretch code is a state state legislation and is binding. Uh, but not everyone agrees with that. Okay, so we have now finished the findings of fact and are ready to go to the decision, decision. on waivers. Uh, and so we're headed back to the back. Um, the first two, uh, I think are unexceptional, um, but does anyone have anything to, any comments to make on either of those? Pat, I would just note on number two, the applicant had said it was 20 feet. It is 24 feet because it's, it's, it's a calculation based on the, the length of the overall length of the building. Um, and so it ends up being 14 feet plus 10 feet. So it's 24 feet. Yeah. I, I, this came up on August 15th, I thought. And I, th I think, and I thought that the applicant actually agreed with that at the time. Okay. Number three, um, the, the issue with number three was filling in the blanks. Um, and you, we can do that with the usable open space because they don't have anything that meets the the distribution the the 25 by 25 um, objective um i was wondering what we still have a blank on landscape and i'm wondering whether we should just I, i'm wondering what we should do with that i i did add in at the end i suggested adding in as a show as shown on the approved plan so that at least that nailed it down to what to what it looks like on paper um but i don't know if we're able to fill in the blanks on the landscape open space mr klein do you have an idea about what to do about that um i would i can take another look at their landscape plan and try to make a determination based on that as to what the percentage ought to be because they do have a buffer around the edge, right? Um, two sides, and so that would count towards landscaped area. And then I just need to check the bylaw as to whether or not their second floor area would qualify or not. Right. So I think if we can sort of tell ourselves that we accept the part that's in red and let Mr. Klein do a little more work on filling in the blanks on uh the part that we haven't got yet uh, I, this th this could be put into the bag uh mr chair you mr leblanc uh i was just looking at the cover sheet for the drawings that they submitted with the initial application and in that table of the zoning summary there's um there's some information there about um their open space so i'm assuming that's calculations from them because it's listed under the proposed column so they say 1,500, I'm assuming, square feet uh, landscape and 2,000 square feet usable open space. There's a good thought. The 2,000 usable? 2,000 usable and 1,500 landscape. Okay. We can work with that. Okay, I... I'm slightly, unless this, is it, how is it, 
set of questions. How is it possible to have 2,000 square feet of usable <laughs> open space? They may be counting the um, the open deck above the garage. The deck? That would be my guess of what they're counting in that. It could be. 2,000 square feet it seems like a lot. But anyway, I... I think I, I mean, I appreciate your raising that, and that's something we should take a take a look at. As as is always the case with applicants' calculations on these categories, they sometimes can't be taken need to be taken with a grain of salt. But it is it may turn out to be that that's that that's correct. It's certainly a good place to look. Okay, so we're going to leave this in the sort of semi-resolve situation and uh, see if we can't work on uh, on filling in those blanks. Uh, it is possible, in my view, that we won't be able to fill in the blanks in a way that we're comfortable. I mean, in in being able to find, and so we may have to think about how else to deal with that. Okay, so we are now getting to yes, yes. I'm sorry, who's who was who sought to speak? Okay, I guess that was just background. All right, so in the next, the next uh, is is it me? All right, I'll I'll, I'll talk less loudly. Uh, on the next item is uh, are two different approaches to bicycle parking. Um, and so I'll give you, why don't I just give you a moment to read this and then I'll sort of set the stage and then maybe ask Mr. Klein to explain the option that he prefers. And, uh, and I've got a somewhat different view, but Let me give you a chance to look at it. So really the difference in substance between these two formulations uh, has to do with the ultimate conclusion. The, but the, the applicant has all along, uh, previously it sought 70 spaces, which in, by the applicant's calculation was what the bylaw required, uh, of which uh, the largest part, the, you, you have to tabulate them separately uh, between long-term and short-term. Um, and they have asked in on August 15th for a reduction in for, for us to say that they are planning to do less than that, but not that much less than that. So they're planning on 60 spaces instead of uh, 66, I think, and uh, five spaces instead of six for a short term. Um, but they don't want to be committed to that they want to be committed to something less. They have always been in this position. In other words, on the very day they filed the application at a time when they were talking about having 70 bike spaces, they were asking for a waiver down to 43. So they've always had this big gap between what they say they're planning to do and what it is that they are willing to be held responsible for doing. Um, it is possible it's not too clear. We didn't talk about it on August 15th, and there may have been a misunderstanding, but it's possible that they've asked, they are asking to reduce that 43 to only 21. Um, so we have really three main options. One is we could say, uh, all right, you can have it down to 21. 
which is a pretty big gap between 21 and uh, and 60 something, 66. We could say you were always at 43. That is what, they, they, uh, at least in terms of their written waiver, that's what they've asked for. Um, and we could say with that we'll, we'll keep you at 43. This is what you started with. You haven't shown us any reason why it is. It needs to be more flexible than that. And that's still a long way from the from what it is you're saying you're planning on doing anyway. And the third thing that we could do uh, is to, other than deny the waiver, uh, is to say, look, you say that you are go you're going to do X, Y, and Z, you say you're going to put all of this in here and you, um, and we're going to hold you to your word. So we're going to waive it only to, only insofar as it's necessary to get down to what you are stating that you're, that you're willing to do. Um, the, neither of these alternatives except the 20, going down to 21. Uh, the one above gives you two subalternatives, one of which sticks at 543, and the other would go to uh, what it is they're planning to do. And the one below, the second one, uh, which you know covers largely the same territory, uh, only provides the option of basically going from what they originally requested as a waiver to just enough of a waiver to let them do what they say they propose to do. And with that, uh, I'll call on Mr. Klein, who's got a view on this. And uh, and this is this is one of those issues that we need to discuss. I'll just say that there there has been a certain amount of planning on one thing and being and asking to be committed to do a lot less. And uh, in a project that is asking for drastic par parking reductions uh, from us that we're entitled to give. Um, you know, it makes a big difference, at least to me, whether you're talking about at least being pretty near code for the uh, for the bicycle parking in a place that's being vaunted as a great location for bicycles, uh, and uh, a uh, and and then a, a much more modest uh, commitment. So the the only other thing I want to say is the last pair, set last sentence in the first option needs to be there period because one of the things that they've asked for is a variation uh, from the bicycle parking design guidelines this is what enables them to hang the bikes up and with without that waiver uh then the conversation about numbers is entirely idle Mr. Klein Mr. Klein, you're muted. There we go. Um, I know there was, there was an email from Mary. Um, I've been trying to find it um, where she sort of provided some minor corrections to the draft um, decision. And I had thought in there was where she had indicated the two numbers were 60 and five, um, which is why I had included them in mine. Um, that that was under in what she was she was amending <clears throat> excuse me factual finding number twenty six at in the draft she was looking at uh, she said change seventy to at least sixty long term and ten to five short term yep uh, and I've lost my place there's a concern that there may be a need for more space when the final plans are done in these areas. So that was in the finding of fact, mm -hmm. and it was ultimately the reason for the reduction that she asked for was to accommodate the concern that they may, may need some more space when the plans are done. So they've reduced it from there. Then with respect to the waiver, it's a little hard because we have it listed as two different waivers and they have the, um, they have the, uh, but what she says in number two is number four, which is this waiver possibly, revise 1.5 and insert one, uh, which I think would be incorrect. Uh, and the total parking spaces required are 43 and the applicant seeks a waiver for 21. Um, 
Now that, I think that's totally about automotive. It could be. It doesn't say. I think I think she's confused because they, in their waiver request about bicycle parking, they never mentioned the word bicycle except in the very last line. I don't. Uh, that uh, uh, I did actually check that, and I, mm -hmm. I don't believe that that's the case. In their request, um, I believe they did. Uh, in the material they sent to us. They didn't, but I'm looking at what is section four mm -hmm. in their revised list of waivers. Yeah. Um, they the heading is uh, bylaw section six, subsection six point one point twelve, and the bicycle parking design guidelines. So we're already in the bicycle world. Mm -hmm. uh, then the, she recites the all of the requirements correctly that uh, for, apply to bikes. Um, and then again, the applicant proposes 43 spaces. The applicant seeks a waiver from the bicycle parking design guidelines. So I guess the 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 thing that comes in, she's always been talking about the design guidelines. Mm -hmm. I, and I suppose that that bleeds over to the numbers as well. But it's clear that this is a section that in her mind is dealing with bicycles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I read that differently. I read it as that she's misunderstanding what what four, number four was requesting. Because there's different numbers, because there's short-term parking, long-term parking, and they each have two different factors, and she doesn't address all four factors. Right. I will say that in the very beginning, they had the same language. This is not changed in the, in the revision. Mm -hmm. Uh, and again, it's 43, and it's not 43 broken down into pieces the way you'd expect it to be. So it's it's just a puzzlement. And of course, Ms. O'Connor isn't here to to clarify what it is she uh, she intended there. But I don't think that there's any. I, I just have if there's if there's sentiment to be. I don't necessarily believe that it's proper to interpret her request for going down to 21. But I can't exclude that either. I personally would not be inclined to do that, whether she was requesting it or not. Mr. Hamlin. Mr. Riccadelli. I, I agree with you. I think I think I would I would not feel comfortable doing that, especially with the reduction in um vehicular parking that we have on the project. And, you know, I think that the, the waiver of the bicycle design guidelines gives the applicant a lot of flexibility as well in terms of how they can arrange and, you know, um, create the, the bike parking that we're um, giving them a waiver for as listed here, uh, because those those hanging uh, bike Parking spaces are, are really much more efficient than the, the ones that are required in right. Arlington. Right. And I will say that you, the drawings all show this. The show, they have several drawings that show what their bicycle parking plans are and where it's all supposed to be and so forth. It's quite clear that you wouldn't be able to achieve any, even your, their 43, I think, but certainly what they're proposing to do without being able to rely on the waiver of the design guidelines. So as between 43 and increasing it to whatever they, to the, uh, whatever I just read that they actually were asking for in the memorandum, uh, where do you all stand? Uh, Mr. Chair? Mr. Blank. Um, I'm a a little torn on it because I've seen this go the other way where um, we had a affordable project similar to this um, that was recently built and um, you know we we're walking by the site and you know most of the bike storage spaces were empty um, and it was a you know requirement of, of the city to have that many spaces so I'm just trying to find a balance as to what that number should be. I know, cause I also agree that, you know, we're reducing the parking pretty significantly. And also we've really touted the being right next to the, uh, 
the bike path. So trying to find that balance. Um, but definitely, I think somewhere in that 60 or 40 is probably where I would land. I will say, it, I mean, it's theoretically, we can grant a waiver for whatever we want, I think. Mr. Pavery can tell it. I mean, if we decided, well, 60 was not giving them quite enough flexibility and 43 isn't supported in any way, it doesn't broken down between long and short-term parking, we could say 50, which, or say 20% less than they're proposing or any any numbers like that. I mean, numbers have this this capability of filling in an infinite line. And so uh, we could do that, uh, that it is possible for us to do that. It's any particular place on that continuum that you fall is arbitrary. But I suppose if it's just related to the request and it's just there to provide additional flexibility, we, that's another possibility that we haven't discussed. Mr. Klein, what do you think? No, I'm still, I still sort of feel that the, that that brief request that was put in to put the number one, to change 1.5 to one and change it to 40, you know, change the number to 21 really applies to the parking, the, the, the car parking and, and I, I just think it was an error on their part and because earlier on they had said they wanted the numbers to be 60 and five so i think it was just it's just odd if the waiver request is different than what they asked for in the finding it was however in the beginning as well yeah i mean it, so it's not something that's new or something that only came at that last minute memorandum yeah I just want to make sure whichever we do, we're very deliberate about what the numbers should be, what they're requesting, and what we're giving them. Right. At this point, I think we're very clear on what the number ought to be, and but we're not quite sure on exactly what they're requesting. No, I think we are clear on what they're... I was just sort of just saying, of the three things that to be clear on, one is what is what would be required without a waiver. And I think we have that pretty clear. One is what they're actually proposing to do after taking the flexibility that they feel that they need. And that is the uh, what I read from their, from their paper, their memorandum earlier on. Um, <laughs> the one thing that isn't clear here is what they're requesting, which is different from what they're proposing to do. Requesting is what they're willing to be held accountable to. And proposing is what they aspire to. And we have to, and I don't know that, we, other than saying, I'm pretty sure that what they imagined all along was 43, because that at least has been there, has been always there to begin with. And that I have always assumed that that rep represented a big difference between what they're responsible for and what they want to do. Mm -hmm. um, but but on the other hand, they they do say that that the the reduction that they've requested in the findings of fact are are there specifically to provide them the flexibility they need to deal with un, with uncertainty in the layout of the parking garage. So uh, I don't know. I'm I'm a little bit worried that I'm a little bit worried about overdoing it, but. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, again, I'm, I have in the back of my head that, that we are planning on allowing them a, a pretty big reduction in parking, although yeah. we have some justification from that apart from this. Well, I think if we go, I guess I would be comfortable if we want to go ahead, you know, we can assess it at 43 and then in our decision, in our your response to the waiver request, we just need to be clear as to what we're asking for. Okay. That makes uh, sense. Mr. Chair. Mr. Blank. Uh Just looking back through some of the documentation we, re we received, and they actually have a slide in one of their presentations devoted to the bicycle parking. Right. And in that, they show 64 long-term spaces with eight short-term. 
spaces. Right. So I think uh, leaving it with the 60 and I believe it was five for the short term, I think fits within what they've presented to us. I think you're right, Mr. LeBlanc. They they originally were were when they they were originally presenting the additional numbers, and then and then they they're now reducing them, but they're not reducing them anywhere near as drastically as as in terms of what again in terms of what they're they're proposing to do as opposed to what they wish to be held accountable for doing. Yeah, and uh, and as you mentioned before the requirement to waive the design guidelines for the bicycle parking gets them to that number uh, based on the this slide that, you know, they're, they're saying certain right. ways of storing bikes gets them this many spaces and, and the like. So you're right. We would also need that waiver request for the parking guidelines. Mr. Ricardelli, do you have a view? I agree with what um, Adam just said. I, I think, I, I you know, uh, we can only work off what they've asked us asked us for and and the plans that we've been shown. And so far, they've been proposing more bikes than this. And if they're asking for a reduction, you know, I personally feel more comfortable with the the sixty and five number because it has some finding and and what they've asked for, and it's still a reduction from what they. They originally showed us uh, rather than what I'm sort of interpreting is that if we go with the 43, we're sort of guessing at how that's distributed amongst the long term, short term. Um, yeah, I think that I, I don't I don't know of anything that is clear about that. Um, so the people I can't see on my screen are Ms. Hoffman. Do you have a view? There you are. I hi, sorry. <laughs> I I think I agree with what you and Dan have been saying. And I I'm I would like to hold with the 60 and five. Mr. Holy. Um, yeah. Um, I think it, it, if I understand it correctly, it was, so they're seeking 43 instead of 60, right? Yeah, is to keep that flexibility they might use to swap out any discrepancy or, you know, special arrangement that they have for other parking space looks like. Um, I think that's. I think it's yeah. clear that they have in mind asking for forty three. They because they right. they've done that from the beginning. Um, yeah, I, could we know a little more? Uh, putting them the question or too late for that. Mm -hmm. um, it is I, ironic that on the fifteenth, this is one one waiver that we didn't talk about at all. Right. It would have been nice, but we didn't think of it. Anyway, I'm sorry but, to interrupt, Mr. Lee. No, I am. Um, right. Um, I think they're seeking 43 from what I could, from what I gather. Um, I could, either way, I mean, 43 is not bad. 21 is out of question for sure. So if it's 60, 60 or 5, long term, short term, or 43, up either way is okay for me. Um, I don't see a you know, significant impact. Right. So, Mr. Klein, you're an expert in counting votes, and these <laughs> votes have all been very thoughtful votes and yeah. not just yes or no or 43 <laughs> or 60. So, where do you I, think we are? So, I believe that we are looking. So the, I think so. There's two parts. One is what the request actually is, and I think we are we have sort of gotten to the point where we're all in agreement that the request is for 43 bicycle parking spaces, uh, but they do not make a differentiation between short and long. So, 
uh, working off of your language, I was just changing sort of the back end of it. So it read the total number of bicycle parking spaces required by this section would be 72 spaces, 66 spaces long term and six short term. The applicant proposes 43 total bicycle parking spaces. The applicant also requests a waiver from the bicycle parking design guidelines. Um, and I would leave it at that. They didn't ask for any additional waivers from other aspects of the zoning bylaws that relates to bicycle parking. Well, I think that one of the, the reason I put that language in there actually is because I think the bicycle parking design guidelines are just mm -hmm. guidelines and they're not actually a waiver of anything. Mm, okay. And the only reason why they matter is because they expound upon certain provisions of the zoning bylaw that deal with design. So essentially, they're like interpretive rules. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, if you only waive the interpretation and don't waive the underlying statute, you haven't really accomplished anything. Okay. So if we were to maintain that, I think we need to be very clear about what provisions of the were waving because it's that a makes sense. big section that right. makes sense yeah i agree um so if we're okay with this portion of it then this being the or part of strike all of that then the board then we do need to come up with um A better statement as to what exactly we're doing and i think waiver granted doesn't quite do it yep um the question i think we can we have sort of a couple different options here so one would be we can provide them with the with the numbers that we want um and we can pro we should if we should do that we should also uh provide some guidance as to what parts of this the you know, that was it six one ten or six one twelve or whatever that section is, um, six one twelve that we are willing to um, to waive. Great. All right. So what I would propose doing at this point is leaving it at that. Uh, we'll go. We'll finish off. We'll go back into six point one point twelve and uh, and specify that that isn't very difficult. Mm -hmm. um and so we'll have language i guess that i do think that we that if we give them a if we did give them a waiver of 43 mm -hmm. i think that if they haven't asked how it's distributed we need to um because it makes a difference whether it's long and short term uh and i don't know how you would interpret 43 when the statute breaks it down that way um and and then let's sleep on it and you know come to a conclusion uh um uh, and come come to a conclusion next tuesday okay this is actually probably the hardest thing uh so far yeah. mr Turner. Uh, mr dupont I so, didn't ask you what you thought because you weren't well, on the screen. You know why? Because <laughs> I, I was just sort of ticking along with Adam and Dan and then Venka. I, I just tended to think that, you know, they what they said or what they had on their plan, which was, I believe, what was it, 66 and 5 or whatever those numbers were. I mean, that's really all we know, except for the fact that they're saying 43 but it's undifferentiated. And your comment earlier was we could put in any number we wanted. And, and what I was curious about though, is just in terms of formatting, if we say, you know, that they're requesting 43 and then we have to somehow expand on that um, by saying, well, that's gonna be divided into X number of long-term and Y number of short-term, are we actually granting the waiver <laughs> or are we denying the waiver in imposing some other uh, condition? I'm just not clear what our actual, you know, what, what the format is if we say 
uh, no to what you've asked because you haven't given us enough information and we're supplying you with information. I just yeah. didn't know if that provides some additional problem for us from a draft. That is an interesting thing. It's a little bit it's a little bit different from saying granted to the extent that right because because you're dealing with apples and oranges here because they're asking for a single total a, a combined total when all when we're thinking about having it separated out. Uh, you know, you could probably give them less than they ask for uh, as long as it's on the same scale. I'm not sure what happens when you when then you take an additional step there. Mr. Haverty, if I've, I've now uh, filibustered long enough for you to have some th thoughts on this. I wonder if you could comment on, on Mr. DuPont's observation. With regards to the issuance of a waiver, your authority is really anywhere from what the bylaw requires all the way down to zero. And it, it doesn't have to be specifically what the applicant requested. You can grant even more leeway if you want. You can grant less. At the end of the day, the only really deciding question is whether or not they can construct their development as proposed if you don't grant this waiver. So if they don't have enough space to do the number of bicycle parking spaces that you are proposing to require, that's going to lead to an appeal and a claim that your decision has rendered the, the project uneconomic. So that's really your only limiting factor. If you feel that there's sufficient amount of room for, for them to do the number of bicycle parking spaces that you are requiring with whatever you know, leeway on the bylaws in terms of the design standards that you grant, you can pretty much do whatever you want. Yeah, thank you. Welcome. All right. So I still think thinking about it and getting a combined, you know, Mr. Klein has already sort of put things together about that. And uh, it, the key thing, I, I think, I think we're we're okay really with with the language of four describing what the problem is and now we have to just describe what we can do for the short term phase uh, space um and I'm not 100% some of us I think really would like to go towards the 60 and some of us are feel antsy about that and might want to stick to the 43 in order to avoid inadvertently making the project uneconomic if things break wrong and some of us feel both ways at the same time. So I suggest, why don't we work out a couple of alternatives for the waiver granted language and uh, and just go up or down on, on something next week. Okay, so if that's our if that's acceptable to you, that can be a reserve point and we get to number five. And number five is the um, is the uh, um, is the parking waiver, uh, and th the options that are here are twofold. Uh, one is to say it's denied as unnecessary because we're accessing our we're exercising our authority to reduce the number of spaces. Um, and to do that, we have to say that there's a sufficient number of park uh, spaces, and we also have to say there's a TDM plan. We have required a TDM plan, and or we will have required a TBM plan, maybe even in more than one location, uh, but the TDM plan is sort of a special purpose thing because many of the things that uh, are listed in this, the bylaw as things that we should be considering are things that the applicant can't do, and some of the things that they are willing to, to do are not listed. So there's a catch-all there, and there's a good argument that we are capable, we have the authority to, uh, but we don't have a TDM plan. We're only asking, making them make one up and get it approved by uh, the senior transportation manager. So I would say that it's not like 100% sure that the reduction, reduction here is strictly in, in compliance with the statute. 
So one way of doing it is to say, do the same thing as we'll be asked to do with respect to the stormwater bylaw and to say that it's unnecessary and we're exercising our authority to reduce the number of parking spaces to 21. And uh, that's a possibility. The second possibility is uh, to say that the board believes it would be sufficient and the TDM plan is also sufficient and uh, we exercise our discretion to uh, allow the reduction and to the extent to which it might be thought ineffective, the waiver is granted. Uh, so the first one basically just is exercising our authority and that's it. The second one is exercising our authority but granting the waiver just in case. Uh, and Mr. Klein, I wonder if you have a view on any of this. Klein, your microphone's off. Thank you. Um, you know, we are allowed to reduce the amount with a, with a TDM in place, but we don't have a TDM, and they haven't really talked about one per se. Um, so I think sort of the alternative that you provide, um, which is the one in red, um is a little makes a little bit more sense um you know because we are allowed to make the reduction we don't have a tdm but we find in this case we don't you know we can we can do what we we can just grant the waiver does anyone else have a view I agree with that. If if it's a prerequisite for the waiver denied to actually have a TDM plan and we don't have it, uh, it seems to me that the alternative at least deals with that fact, if, if I understand uh, Christian's comment. Yep. So if I do, I, I favor that approach, the alternative. Okay. Does so anyone else wish to address this one? Okay, so I think right now, uh, the, so far, the alternative has it. So going, if anyone dissents with that, please let, let me know and we'll continue talking about it. And otherwise we can uh, put this one to bed. Yeah, our ability to reduce the parking through TDM requires them to adopt at least three different uh, components and most of them they're not allowed to provide by their uh, funding mechanism. So I think we we may be in a position where we really only can grant the waiver. Right. Okay. Well, I think that we sh I think that that seems sound. And why don't we say that we'll that's where we are yeah. and uh, go on to the next. They get easier after this. <laughs> um, the next one is uh, has to do with the uh, parking spaces. And the only question I have there, the numbers are a little bit dodgy, I think, on this one. But I have a feeling that the insert on the third line down, 60% or 21 spaces, is probably meant to say 60% of 21 spaces, which isn't perfect, but it's a lot closer to the 11 that they're asking for than than uh, whatever 60% of X comes out to 21. Mm -hmm. Is there, I, I didn't write that part actually. Is that Mr. Haverty, was that your intent? Right, which one is this? This is in number six, the third line down, the applicant requests a waiver to allow 60% or 21 spaces and so on. And I, I think that in their actual request, they specify that what they're asking for is 11. Am I right about that? I have to go back and look at that, Mr. Chairman. No, it doesn't. It doesn't say. It says to permit more than twenty percent of the spaces to be sized by compact car, but I'm pretty sure that at some point they say they want eleven spaces to to be compact spaces. Does anyone remember that differently? Unfortunately, I can't find that. Sort of 
statement from Mary where she sort of outlines what she's looking for for final changes. Let me see if I can I can find it. I have it sort of sitting out. Let's see if I can. That probably is where my 11 came up. All right, so this is waiver number six. Yeah. And what she says there is the applicant seeks 11 compact spaces or 60%. Okay. So I think it would be the easiest thing to do and the clearest thing to do is just grant her 11. And then not worry about what it's 60% of. Yeah. Not to not to complicate complicate anything, but uh, it's twenty one spaces total, right? So sixty percent would be like thirteen, right? Okay. Yeah, I'm I'm aware of that. When I said that the arithmetic was the numbers were a little dodgy, that I was what I was okay. referring to. And I did actually some manipulation and 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 could not find. Any number that was related to sixty percent that would have any meaning in this case at all. So it's just, it's just rounding error. Okay, uh, but the proposal in any event is whatever they're asking for is to grant it, yeah. and I think that that we probably are willing to do that. Is there anybody who would object to that? No. Okay, so the next waiver is number seven. Um, and this is the to reduce the um, the aisle size. Um, and I'm not I don't think that there that is uh, there hasn't been any discussion of that. Does anybody have any objection to that one? Did her most recent request further reduce that to twenty one? Um, you, that would refer to the memo, right? Yeah. Um, number seven. Yes, they do. It does. They do have twenty-one. Okay. Twenty-two should be twenty-one. What's it? Twenty-one feet. I'm getting a little concerned. As to just how much maneuvering space they they really have. And I would ask, you know, other members of the board what they think about the the number of twenty one. I I agree with you, Mr. Clyde. Twenty two is um, fairly standard. I mean, it's always required to be twenty four in most jurisdictions, but twenty two you see around twenty one does does feel kind of tight for for ninety degree parking spaces. What is on the, what do they have in their plans? If you were looking back at the drawings. It was originally 23, I thought. Yeah, and I had written down here 22 and until the memo, uh, I, I, that's where I thought they were on the, until uh, Ms. O'Connor's memo of the, 15th. I'll check through the drawings right now and just see what they had. You know, our decision here does have some bearing on the bike parking as well, because the more the more constricted this is, the harder it is to for them to balance everything, which I think is part of the reason why you're seeing a certain degree of angst on their part. They've got only a little bit of space and they've got to meet a lot of goals for that space. Mr. Chair, it looks like um, based on the drawings I'm seeing, they're saying 23 feet. Uh, 
And I, I do recall, I think it was at the last meeting where they did request for that to be reduced. Kind of verbally. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Does anyone remember what I, it sounded more, what it sounded a lot like was that they were redesigning the, that lower floor and we're just looking for, you know, sort of some some blanket room to move and maneuver things. Okay. And like they didn't have a specific request in terms of, you know, there's this situation we ran into, we really need to have 21 feet. Well, I don't, I, as you all know, I don't have the expertise one way or the other on knowing what is or isn't an appropriate thing here. Um, but I am somewhat concerned that as you get smaller, as, as you get smaller and smaller, you develop a safety problem that we wouldn't want to do. So it's, I, if I'm right about that, then it's not sort of cost free to keep going down. Um, I don't have any problem with 22 and I don't have the sense that anybody else does. Uh, I do have a note in my notes from our 8-1 meeting that says 22 foot minimum on drive aisle width. That helps. Yeah. It kept going down, right? It was started at 23 and then it was 22 and then it was, it's 21. Yeah. Um, so I guess the I should start my video again. The uh, what it, well we have five architects on the board. How bad is twenty one? Is this a, I mean there's there's one thing about there's a difference between misgivings and heartburn and. Heartburn, we won't do it, and misgivings, we might. And I'm trying to figure out where we are in the heartburn and misgivings. My, spectrum. my feeling is that if you know, if it was 21 feet and it was between two area, two aisles where there were compact cars, it might work because um, the cars are smaller. But if you had a longer vehicle, 21 feet, real, you know, you've lost three feet, and you know, just have one person park badly, and all of a sudden. You know, you really can't get out anymore. Okay, and the and they do have eleven. I mean, half of their spaces are compact, uh, but not all of them, right? So that still creates a that problem. Yeah, and then they also noted somewhere that the location of the compact cars would be determined at the final plan. Nothing is final, right? Hopefully they would they would do that in a way to make the geometrics of the parking thing work as as well as possible. But right, um, Mr. Chair, Mr. Riccardelli, uh, you know, maybe if I could make one suggestion, uh, you know, my only concern about the the twenty one is really right where you enter the parking garage because it's back to back parking. Um, where they had proposed previously, you know, 22 feet, where it's a single aisle parking uh, up against the back of the project. Um, but that's not really a concern. So, you know, I, I don't want to split hairs here, but uh, we could say where there's back-to-back -back parking, the minimum aisle width is 22 feet at, at single loaded drive lanes. We could give them the flexibility to go to 20 feet. And that may give them a little bit more room to maneuver um, because that's typically a standard at, at single loaded 90 degree parking, 20 feet is acceptable. So, Mr. Klein, what do you think about that? I think that's reason that that's perfectly reasonable. Um, I would note on the August 1st drawing set for the civil, they do show uh, 22.3 feet on the single loaded and 23 feet on the double loaded um, for aisle widths. So 
not 100 sure why they're requesting it but we could say um yeah i i think what you know what mr Cardelli said is is very is very astute that you know where it's double loaded the you, you really want the bigger number but where it's single loaded it's not quite as bad um because you're not going to hit another person's vehicle you're just going to hit the wall so um i, think I would suggest Ms. Travity. It, what i would suggest is that if the plans show a minimum of 22 feet all around then the waiver should be for 22 feet if at some point they feel like they need to come in and provide the board revised plans that show a smaller width and have a new request for a waiver, you can you know consider that as a modification. But I don't think that you should be granting a waiver above and beyond what they're showing on their plans. But that's even though they've asked specifically asked for it. Correct. They did ask for the 21. But their plans don't show it. Yeah. Okay. So if we indicated that they requested 21, but we say the waiver granted to allow a drive aisle of 22 feet as indicated on with the approved, the approved plans. plans. Right. So, Mr. Havity, if I could does this principle apply equally to the to the bike parking? Because the bike parking, the plans show actually more than they're currently asking for. I 100% agree with that. The waivers should be consistent with the plans. If they want to come back at some point and, and submit revised plans and ask for a modification, certainly within their right to do so. Okay, well, that sort of has a bearing on yeah. our consideration of the earlier issue. Yeah, and I can take a I can take a pass at that for next time. Right. I guess we also need to make sure. I mean, I I I certainly have looked at plans which said. But they had they have lots of bike plans that they had specifically and so forth. I'm I do we do need to make sure that if we I'm not a hundred percent sure that the plans that we've looked at are listed in the approved plans in A2. So we probably we might want to make sure that we're looking at something that really has plan uh, on it and is not just a exhibit for our benefit. But uh but that that just means kind of looking back at where looking at the things that we know are plans and seeing what's what's illustrated there. All right. So we're now at number eight. Are we? Is it eight? Number yes. Eight. Number eight. Okay. So. Mr. Haverty, why don't you explain this one? Okay, so as I read this provision of the bylaws, it was applicable to parking and loading areas which are not inside a structure. And my understanding was that the parking for this development is inside a garage. So I, I don't think it would be applicable and therefore not necessary. Everybody agree with that? Okay. Yep, so, the first sentence of that is, of that section of the bylaw is all parking and loading areas containing over five spaces which are not inside a structure. Right. Right. Oh, very clearly not applicable. So, all right. So then let's get to number nine. Uh, and this is similar to to that, Mr. Uh, Mr. Haverty. Yeah. So this this section applies to buffers in any industrial or business district that abut certain buildable residential lots. And I, I don't believe this abuts any buildable residential lots. So mm -hmm. I don't believe that this provision is applicable either. 
Yeah, I think I did look at the zoning map and all of the lots that are at least immediately adjacent to this, plus the lot across the street, are uh, either B2, B2A or B4. It might be useful, though, I wonder, uh, I, it might be useful to include language in the request, the, the description of the sections to include the buildable residential lot point in it, because now the reason why it is we don't think it's applicable is not apparent from the reading of of the description of the section. Or is that, okay. does that make sense? Now, I think no, it's I only think... A that's like that, but B just refers to a different, to the section that's dealt with in eight, if I'm not mistaken. So we would change that to waiver denied is not applicable to the project, comma, as the property does not abut any buildable residential lots. Okay. I, I was thinking of putting the buildable residential lots in the in the text, but either one works fine. That. Okay, the next one up is uh, <clears throat> waiver 10 for fees. Mr. Klein, do you want to explain this one? So the applicant had requested a waiver from all fees, which is something the town had done on their uh, project on Westminster Avenue. Um, so we had... Pat and I had approached uh, the town manager and department heads asking if they would be willing to do the same thing here. And uh, they had agreed and the way the board action listed here is, I believe the text is directly from the uh, town manager's uh, letter. Yes. It isn't a it isn't a complete clue because of moving clauses around, but all the main language is all familiar. Yeah. Does anyone have any difficulty with granting these waivers? All right, so let's let's go on to eleven. Eleven is the stormwater bylaw. <clears throat> excuse me, the stormwater bylaw issue. And again, this is this is one where uh, I, mean, I I'm not looking at the at the bylaws. So my recollection, as I mentioned earlier, is that it does not apply the stormwater the town stormwater management bylaw does not apply um, uh, if unless if you have a certain amount of increased impervious pavement and here there's less than there was before and uh, that or that that it was more than an acre and this is a third of an acre. So uh, the applicant has requested is to say that uh, what is said here on the uh, in purple and uh, except for the fact that there's two periods at the end of purple that seems unacceptable, unexceptionable. Does anyone have a... Okay, if we're okay on that one, um, number 12 is one of the few things in all of this that hasn't changed at all. Does anyone proposed to change that situation. OK, 
Okay. Well, seeing, seeing no comments, let's move on to number 13. Um, now, here, it's not clear to me why it is we're dealing with both 13 and 11, since one seems a subset of the other. I, I think mainly because that's what the applicant requested. So we're simply addressing all of their waiver requests. Okay. It may not right. be strictly necessary if we're granting 13, but. Yeah. Well, or 11. 11 is the broader one, right? Because it, the, the, the. Well, the, 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 there is one thing. So I'm looking at, I'm, sorry, I'm looking at this. So 11 is the stormwater bylaw. Right. 13 is the stormwater management rules and regulations. So they are different documents. Yeah. So right. you would okay. need separate waivers. Okay. Well, that's fine. I mean, the reason for the waiver here is that the bylaw that the rules are implementing doesn't apply. Okay. So do we just say waiver granted? Or do we want to include something more similar to what we did for 11? Either one's fine with me. Yeah, I would, I think that, well, either one is fine. As long as the waiver, the, the thing that would be dangerous is to not grant the waiver and rely on our interpretation of the stormwater bylaw and then find that the town manager doesn't agree with that. That would be that would be a bad result. Whereas mm -hmm. if you grant the waiver, you granted it. You may not have needed to, but you did anyway. Yeah. Okay, so we're really coming down now to the very, I think, the very last bylaw, the one that's totally new. Not bylaw, the very last waiver. And this has to do with noise abatement. Mm -hmm. uh, um, Mr. Klein? Yeah, so essentially this came about when we were reviewing the the draft decision. Um, we had included language that had been approved through a waiver for uh, previous projects that would allow work to begin at 7 a.m. on weekdays and 8 a.m. on Saturdays. And the applicant had indicated they wanted that as well. So we needed to add this one more um, uh, one more waiver request, and they were in agreement, um, as had been done on prior projects, that we will grant them the 7 a.m. on weekdays and the 8 a.m. on Saturdays. However, there will be no work on Sundays and holidays um, in exchange for that. So, and they agreed to it. So just putting that here in writing. So is there any, does anyone object to that? Okay, we've come to the end of the waivers. So we've made findings of fact. We've gone through the waivers. The two hours that I originally said we'd try to do um, have expired. Um, and at the wish of, at the risk of contradicting myself. Um, I wonder if you can take a, if you are willing to take a look, if we're, we're next going to conditions. And it turns out that we don't have much work to do on conditions that are sort of at the beginning. And it would be nice to get one of the two of the subsections out of the way, which I think we can do in just a few minutes. Uh, so if we can go back to conditions A general, There, and leaving aside, postponing until next week to deal with the August 1st, 2023, which has to do with finding where those plans actually are and making sure that they're properly in the record. Um, and so that could, that could mean that we'd have to undo or redo some things. Um, we don't really have any 
amendments of substance until we get to um, I think until we get to A6. Is that right, Mr. Mr. Klein? That's correct. Just cleaning up number four to 600 square feet. Yeah, so A6 is again, is about the waiving of fees. That, I take it that that should be essentially, I mean, we have waived it. So I, I'm not sure that there's anything really to think about here. Yeah, there is a yeah. war. Yeah, there is a war. So we can go ahead and just drop that second part. Great. Uh, okay, so I don't think if there's anything else in section A. I do not see anything else in section A. Now in section B, we go back to the original discussion we had on the subsidizing agency. And um, there's there's one potential change in, in B1, and otherwise we're with Mr. Uh, Haverty's language. And um, I think that, I mean, this was the key condition. This is the one, this is the one that's a condition rather than just uh, uh, a finding of fact. And uh, and I think that this is what we've been pulling up for. I think ultimately, to me, the most important thing is the last sentence, which is, I think, a position that we really ought to take and that has been implicit in the decisions we've made up to now in the findings of fact. Is everybody comfortable with this language? Something wonky with the grammar, but I'll look at that. Okay. So before changes um, sale to rent up, which probably gives you a, a, a glimpse into the archeology span of this provision. Right. So I'm going to press my luck since it's only 2139. It's 939. But if we look at C, we don't have a whole lot there no. either. Um, and the first question in C is whether we ought to uh, require a uh, deposit at, at the appropriate time, of course, uh, to for purposes of peer review when you go to the uh, when when you're doing your final plans. Um, and uh, we have, I think, in the past, used 6,500, I think that in one of the other cases, uh, I've suggested adding not reasonably able and available just to make it clear. It is often the, true that we have people with technical expertise to do the kind of review that's required here, but they're already being overutilized six times over and they just they just can't so i wanted to make clear that that was a reason why it is we have to use a peer review consultant um, other than that there's nothing very exceptional about this paragraph that i that i know does anyone have any dis discontent with this one all right the next 
place where there is a proposed change, um, I believe in is in number H. So there was just a, a brief one in C. Um, okay. Because they are providing street trees, I just wanted to note that when we're talking about trees that are along streets and walkways, that they should be salt tolerant. So I just wanted to include the word trees okay. in there. Great. That's all that was. Um, so, sorry. The, there's a deletion, wait a minute. Where H, right? Although it's, I guess now not H anymore. So H, the sewer permits have been changed by the with different language with respect to the to uh, waiver, and that we don't waiver certain things and we do others. Um, and so, in this, that's is that H itself right and then j is the deletion of test pits which should be uncontroversial because they're not doing doing those the original h and the original i are essentially the same with a with some change in language so we're going to strike h and keep the former i which will become the new i h great does anyone have any difficulty there and did anyone have an issue over those things which i whizzed on by because there were no proposed changes but you all may have had a change and suddenly you've lost your chance. So if there's anything that you want to draw attention to that I don't draw attention to, you should certainly feel free to stop and say, wait a minute, let's let's deal with this. Um, okay, that takes us now to D. Mr. Chair, yes, Mr. Question. Holy. Question, that 6,500, was that for the plan review of the, you know, um, but, but that is again wave two. Is no, 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 no. This is this is for, this is for us, right? The town manager waived the, the fees, but the certainly the zoning board isn't going to waive them. Um, these are all things that would be done anyway. That that would be done through fifty three G funding, just as we had Mister uh, uh, Mister Reardon it doing was... it for now. Uh, there's a lot of things that have been postponed to review of final plans. And so there may very well be work for a peer review consultant to do at that stage to make sure the final plans are consistent with the preliminary plans, but the preliminary plans give rise to a certain degree of flexibility. So expert advice is apt to be needed. And that's what this is about. It's not part of the fee waivers that uh, were agreed to by the the town manager, you'll set up an account just like we did with Tetra Tech and you fund put funds into it. And the only thing about the 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 deposit is that you put it in first. Okay. Right. Mr. Averty, do I have that basically right? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Okay. All right. So we have now gone through A, B, and C of the conditions. We did that in 12 minutes, mm -hmm. and I'm not planning on pressing my luck. Uh, I think that we've done- We can do D. We can, we do, can do D. All right. <laughs> or if, maybe not. <laughs> if there's popular demand, I'm willing to try it. Sure, let's do D. The D should be pretty easy. So the only issue in D is D2 part B, which is where we're talking about the property management plan. Right. Um, and I believe the applicant had requested that we strike pet policy, staffing, and trash removal. Um, but there were questions that were raised by residents about the trash removal policies. So we wanted to make, I felt it was important to maintain that. Um, and there was also questions about smoking policies. So we'll make sure that remained as well. Um, and then there was a, I believe it was raised, I, Mr. Havity, I can't remember if it was you who had mentioned it, that a copy of the plan needs to be provided to somebody at the state level as well. For the property management plan, it has to go to the subsidizing agency. Subsidizing agency. Yeah. There was, there was language that 
that was proposed by um see if I can find it by Ms. O'Connor. Um and this is on what D what she, yeah, what she wanted at the end was the plan shall be submitted after its approval by the Executive Office of Housing and Livability. So so she has the sequence of events the other way, the way around. She wants to go to the state first, get it approved, and then provide it to the town. And I don't know how that, I don't know what the intent was, given that this has to be prior to the issuance, issuance of a certificate of occupancy. Well, they're going to be required to have this, I think, as part of their final approval submittal. So that's going to be well in advance of certificates of occupancy. So their proposed um, order certainly is fine. Okay, so what they was so what she says the plan shall be submitted after its approval by the executive office. So That's she's fine. looking yep. okay. So Pat, if you could just email me that, I will swap it in. Okay, we'll do. We'll do. All right. So we did. Then E gets ugly. So he's got lots of stuff. So let's let's take a break and pick that up. We we went uh seven. 17 minutes over time but we got through four sections so that that seems like a help that'll make our life a lot our lives easier uh, next week okay so we've reached the end of uh, this session of the deliberations we've made a considerable amount of progress uh, we have a bit to go but it's not that much really and um, next week we'll come to closure on some of the issues that are outstanding from tonight uh, work our way through uh, the remaining issues, and I hope at least be in a position uh, to uh, approve a, a final permit. Um, if not, we ought to be in a position to do it very quickly in a short session, but I'm hoping that we can avoid that. We've gotten pretty far tonight. So that is is if, if sort of the meeting is open for any final comments or suggestions, and so let me stop there. If anyone has been itching to say something, this would be the time to say it. And otherwise, the chair would entertain a motion to to continue the deliberation section to uh, next Tuesday, uh, uh, September 12th at 7.30. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Klein. So moved. Is there a second? second? Seconded by Mr. DuPont. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? I'm going to do a roll call. I have to have to do a roll call even for a By state law, yeah. All right. Mr. Klein. Aye. Mr. Hat. No, not Mr. Haverty. Mr. DuPont. <laughs> Aye. Aye. I've been here enough. I'm almost a voting. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Ricardelli. Aye. Mr. LeBlanc. Aye. Mr. Holy. Aye. Ms. Hoffman. Aye. And the chair votes aye, and we are continued. Thank you. Thank you. Wait, 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 we still need to adjourn. Oh, yep, we do. We do. All right. Does anyone want to move to adjourn, or we can break out the Miller and enjoy ourselves prematurely? Mr. Chairman, I move we adjourn. And I second, Mr. Chairman. Seconded by Mr. DuPont. Um, Mr. Klein? Aye. Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Riccardelli? Aye. Mr. LeBlanc? Aye. Mr. Holy? Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. And we are adjourned. Good night, everybody. Good night, all. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you all.